you know. Kierkegaard has a great book called the, the Works of Love. And in that, he has a chapter called Love Abides. In that chapter, he says, if you had a million dollars, had a million dollars, and you had it one day, and the following day you lose your million dollars and you don't have it anymore. He says it would be historically correct to say that even though you have no more money, you were once a millionaire, that you, you were once rich. You had money, he said. But then he says, if you start loving the agape, covenant, the Christ, this is, I think this is the, the new life. This is the new, this is what happens naturally. This is not something that one has to even work on. Consciousness is what you work on. And when consciousness, when you die before you die, this just happens. Kierkegaard says, if you begin loving and you stop loving, you were never loving to begin with. Unlike the fact that you had a million dollars and you were a millionaire, that is true. But if you stop loving, once you start loving, if you stop it, you were never loving to begin with. When you diminish the blindness, you also diminish the love, because true love makes one entirely blind. When I walked up here, how many of you said to yourself, hey, that's Michael, the ultimate reality. <laughs> let, me, let me see the hands. <laughs> and those that didn't raise their hands, now that you've had a moment to think about it, if you'd like to change your answer, you can raise your hand now. <laughs> How many of you feel like the ultimate reality? Let me see your hands. How many of you feel unlimited? If any of you raised your hands for any of the previous questions, now I'd like you to, to join me in a, in a relational exercise. I'm going to introduce you to the presence of an ultimate reality, a limiting force that you may not have encountered before. Please put your hand in front of you right now, in your front of your face like this. Now I'd like you to pinch your nose and pinch it tightly so that no air can get in or out. And now, shut your mouth. <laughs> Whatever moment that you feel the presence of an absolutely limiting power, <laughs> then you can resume breathing. For anyone that is pushing things to the limit, someone be prepared to call 911. So here's the truth. There is this absolute realm, and yet we find our lives in this relative realm. And the truth is that we live in tension, that, that that's where we live. That there's the absolute and there's the relative, there's the unmanifest, and then there's the manifest, there's, there's the infinite and the finite. And where we get to live is right here. We get to live here in this tension. Now the important thing about that is that <clears throat> not only is that the truth of who we are, but this tension is also the gateway into authenticity. This tension is precisely the path that you and I must follow to find an authentic life. In fact, the most explosive reality in the universe is any time the infinite gets involved with the finite. You have a combustible, incendiary, explosive, transformational reality right there, more than anything else. Now, how do we follow that path? How do we get there to authenticity? It requires two journeys. One journey is a journey of disidentification. And the other journey 
is a journey of personal identification. We must learn, and these two journeys happen sometimes separately, sometimes simultaneously. They are intermingled in our lives. One journey is about detachment from whatever it is we mean by the ego self. The other journey is a journey of attachment to what is it that is my essential reality. Meister Eckhart liked to say that our essential reality does not grow by addition, but by subtraction. Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, like to talk about the fact that if we are to grow into our full power, into our full essential reality, that early in life we must have a lot of reinforcement and support as that ego self becomes strong. But if we are to mature into our full potential, our full power, then we have to lose it. We have to release it. We have to get rid of it. Look at your life and see how you have filled its emptiness with people. As a result, they have a strangle hold on you. See how they control your behavior by their approval and disapproval. They hold power to ease your loneliness with their company, to send your spirit soaring with their appraisal, to bring you down to the depth with their criticism and rejection. Take a look at yourself, spending almost every waking minute of your day placating and pleasing people, whether they are living or dead. You live by their norms, conform to their standards, seek their company, desire their love, dread their ridicule, long for their applause, meekly submit to the guilt they lay upon you. You are terrified to go against the fashion in the way you dress or speak or act or even think. People have become so much a part of your being that you cannot even imagine living a life that is unaffected or uncontrolled by them. Love is to be found only in fearlessness and freedom. Awareness may not be enough for a person whose addiction is people. How many activities can you count in your life that you engage in simply because they delight you and grip your deepest being? Find them out, cultivate them, for they are your passport to freedom and to love. The royal road to mysticism and to reality does not pass through the world of people. Contrary to popular beliefs, the cure for lovelessness and loneliness is not company, but contact with reality. The moment you touch this reality, you will know what freedom and love are. Freedom from people and so the ability to love them. Love first springs in the heart through your contact with the real. Not love for any particular person or thing, but the reality of love, an attitude, a disposition of love. This love then radiates out to the world of things and persons. If you desire this love to exist in your life, you must break loose from your inward dependence on people by becoming aware of it and by engaging in activities that you love to do for themselves. The symbols we live by, consciously or unconsciously, are those entities, those phenomena which give us our concrete images in the light of which we make our decisions and do our living and do our dying. Personhood and selfhood and free existence 
make necessary that you and I become self-consciously present to the symbols by which we understand ourselves and in the light of which we are able to appropriate ourselves. For only here is it possible to be a free being and not be one who is simply caught in the bondage of the configurations of the culture in which we live. The worship we engage in fundamentally discloses our center of meaning with the God we worship, our fundamental loyalty. Most of the time we have been engaging in standing before our own feelings. I like my feelings and feel no need to smash my own illusions. I like my illusions, and if I am overly anxious, I just take a walk in nature in the woods behind my house. This always seems to help. I don't really feel any desire to become too friendly with too much reality. I like nature too, but our consciousness can have access to something more permanent than trees or stars. This deep place can only be accessed through poetry and metaphor. Becoming a friend of the deep place can be intimidating and seems to make no rational sense. The Cloud of Unknowing was written in the 14th century and is just as true today as then. The metaphors were different because the scientific worldview was different. However, the task was the same as now, managing consciousness. If you learn to read all deep literature from the perspective of managing one's personal consciousness, the truth of the material is more likely to appear. The human ego always wants to understand. The cloud of unknowing is about learning how to practice not understanding. I definitely don't understand. Here is what the cloud has to say. When people are filled with hubris, they allow their minds to be misled by hollow ways of thinking, and they easily misunderstand the high upward way. Some are misled by what they read, others by what they hear. Spiritual gurus abound who preach and publish platitudes on how to transcend the limitations of mere mortality and become one with the cosmos. Some gurus spend their lives staring at the stars as if the created universe unveiled in the night sky is the surest way to spiritual enlightenment, the easiest way to hear the angels of heaven sing. Stargazers have always sought to pierce the mysteries of the night sky, hoping to find pattern in the darkness above to make sense of the darkness within. Some have spent their whole lives making gods in their own image dressing them and inflating them with inflated human attributes, setting them on exalted thrones among the constellations to be worshipped. Others believe there is no higher reality than the cosmos, and the highest movement of the human soul is to dissolve into the great cosmic mind. God overlooks such limited ways of thinking and invites us to step out by childlike faith and become a friend of God. I was not aware that I was not aware of my dependence on people. Nor was I aware when I have made a substitute for deep reality out of nature and the cosmos. Yet, I am beginning to grasp that I have spent a lifetime consorting with seductive yet subtle substitutes for ultimate reality. I sense I am being called to pursue a deeper path, a path allowing me to intensify my love and personal friendship with that which is really, always, and finally real. Let's explore this deeper path, 